I'm going to be reporting back on the first um, um, breakaway section, uh, session called Leadership and, and Governance in Leadership that were um, chaired by Professor Kamila Naidu and Dr. Sipaman Lazondi. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of both days. Um, in the first day, we had Madala, Mohale, and Liepile giving us a very good tension between the three presentations talking about the problematics of the state. Um, Maldala's assessment of the 30-day payment compliance by the Department of Infrastructure Development is in the center. Mohale's examination of local government as a development state can be taken in the middle, and Liepile's um, presentation on reasons for hope can be taken as the overarching spirit that animates our analysis of 25 years of democracy. Madala actually used the method, a qualitative method, of looking at four contractors, project managers, and members of the legislature to discover whether or not um, DID was in fact adhering to the good governance principle of paying people within the time that um, was prescribed, 30 days. Um, and then Mohale also used a quali qualitative assessment, looking at eight municipalities to actually look at the extent to which um, local, local government can be taken to be close, um, getting close or closer to a developmental state. And he also used the ANC's 2007, 2007 2012, and um, 2017 strategy and tactics to look at the key principles um, general's um, presentation, where she used a lot of quantitative data to animate the idea that um, South Africans have to have a very good spirit about understanding the extent to which we are not a failed society, and that in fact, um, um, that South Africa, South Africans have a reason for hope and reason to be happy about the gains that have been made. One of the key things that was really um, um, interesting about Liepile's um, presentation is that it was speaking back to Mohale and Madala's um, presentations because she was talking about the need to be very cautious about the language and the descriptions that we use to talk about the kind of work that we have been under, undertaking. I have to be very quick. Okay. I'm just going to skip right to the end in terms of the discussions that um, took place both, no, 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 um, I think I skipped, yes, I skipped day two. Day two, Licht Magda um, gave us a presentation on looking at the water sector to actually establish the extent to which um, democracy has been consolidated in South Africa. Um, Asi Pemka Lisa was looking at the extent to which we can actually talk about gender egalitarianism using an intersectional um, view and the extent to which black women in particular have actually been uh, mainstreamed in terms of their overall socioeconomic needs. Um, Tembane, another researcher from um, parliament, was actually looking at the extent to which um, the 25 years of democracy in parliament have been orderly or disorderly. All three of these um, presentations used the qualitative method. Um, and I mean, if you look at the method and you look at the arguments and um, analytical frameworks that all these um, three analysts used, you can see that perhaps um, if we are talking about decoloniality, we might be just a little far off in terms of understanding um, our, our democracy. Um, Magda was speaking about water being a basic right, and the key and fundamental change that she was talking about there was um, policy shifting from seeing water as a basic right as part of a um, social, of, as part of being a social security network to actually um, treating it as a function of indigency. She actually raised the fact that um, decentralization had resulted in severe um, um, regulatory challenges and that there was intergovernmental um, misalignment and the inability of national um, water affairs to regulate um, water at local, at local level. Asipe's um, um, presentation was incredibly animated and reminded us of the um, multiple oppressions, she calls it, that black women actually suffer in terms of gender, in terms of their gender, in terms of their race, and also in terms of their class, sexuality, and the entire spectrum, that um, South Africa has made prog progress in terms of gender mainstreaming, but a lot had to be done. 
one of the key things that she spoke about was that the TRC process, which was an, a, a process of trying to entrench reconcil reconciliation within South Africa, silenced um, sexual violence of people that um, suffered it um, during apartheid, and that as a result, we see this continuity in, 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 in current times. Tambane's, um, Tambane's presentation was interesting in the sense that there, were, the, there was a peak moment where he saw um, parliament and the practices within parliament actually becoming more, um, you know, functions of what uh, a, a consolidated democracy might look like in terms of uh, more coalitions being formed, in terms of um, people... Um, well, more coalitions being formed and people actually standing and pushing back at what would be like one party dominance. And um, of course, he mentioned that um, that animation was brought through by um, the presence of um, EFF. He also said that in terms of just a conclusion about whether we can think of um, parliament as disorderly or, di or orderly, he said that there's a great adherence to the rules of, of parliament and that in itself um, gives, gives us hope that parliament is in fact orderly. The last slide speaks to the three, three key things that actually animated the overall two-day discussion. We can look at it from a developmental state. There's a lot of, of, of interest in um, the possibility of the different tiers of government actually coming closer to either um, adhering to or achieving different elements of what a developmental state might be. So what you have is Marta, in her conclusion, actually said that what we needed to do was to build the capacity of the state, both at a skills, um, technical and financial, um, financial, financial level. And one of the key things that she said is that the challenges that we do face in, in departments such as water affairs, um, water affairs are not insurmountable, right? So therefore, relinking back to Lepile's reasons for hope kind of presentation. Um, and that we need to have um, greater drive towards um, good, um, good governance. And that perhaps instead of moments where there are failures in implementation, gaps that we've experienced, that perhaps what we need to do is not to um, renovate or add additional policy, um, given that spaces like local government are actually suffering from a burden of, of policy, that what we need is to in fact look at the technical capacity and the people that are supposed to animate those kinds of processes. I think overall, all, all of those presentations from the two days, while very critical in terms of the things that they raised, actually are reasons for hope that in, 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 in moments of dysfunction, there have been areas where there have been best practice and um, a great deal achieved. So I'm going to end there. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Weston. Begin with uh, Lauren Marx, talking about press freedom, 25 years of post-independence. Uh, this presentation uh, proceeded from the understanding that the press is the fourth estate, and uh, when you talk about the doctrine of the separation of powers, the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature, that they have to act independently, to scaffold each other and to ensure that a democracy functions, the media becomes indispensable. And that ties in with the question of freedom of expression and access to information. The presenter, gave us a background about the current state of the media in South Africa, especially in the wake of the advent of social media, whereby with a smartphone and access to the internet, virtually everybody else could pass for a journalist. But that also raises questions of ethics. Um, the audience and the readership is now attuned to real-time news. They no longer wait for news that uh, specific hours as it was before. So this has in a way jolted the traditional media and the so-called mainstream media. 
Uh, the presenter laid bare the, some of the challenges facing the media. But one of the pertinent issues that was raised was that South Africa is relatively doing well. We are quoting from the World Press uh, Freedom Report 2019. They are ranked 31 out of 180 countries, although it's a decline. Last year, 2018, there were 28. But the caveat is that the media is, an, in as much as it's integral to democratization, uh, we must also point out the fact that the media ought to guard against being pro-establishment, being perverse of bigotry, as it happened, say, in countries like Rwanda, in the run-up to the uh, 1994 genocide. And it must also guard against uh, what they call brown envelope, journalism. So there are also ethics and professionalism that the media have to uphold in order to ensure that they play their role of scaffolding democracy. Uh, the recommendations. The presenter recommends that there must be media literacy so that the audience, the readership also is critical enough to gauge and question reports, headlines, and whatever they come across on social media, because and critical consumption of media, uh, of information by the media could also create uh, unintended problems. There must also be uh, a question of funding. The paper highlighted the fact that there's been reduction in funding to the traditional media, which has also led to redundancies and the generalization of media houses. So funding the media is first, but that challenge and it, it's, it's, they have to go out and look for money so that they source the best talent to ensure that they inform, uh, entertain, and educate. There has to be need for awareness of value of journalism in the society. Unlike South Africa and some other countries, the journalists are an endangered species. And uh, we were given the example of Russia, but also this situation obtains across the continent. So there must be a awareness of the uh, indispensability of the media uh, in democratization. Second paper by Njabulo Zwane on popular culture, specifically township music, in relation to a contested black identity. A fairly fervent presentation, and Jabulu uh, did a good job in uh, using popular culture and uh, referring to some of the popular Kwaito musicians, such as um, uh, Lebo Matosa, the late, uh, Mendoza, Boom Shaka, uh, how these artists use music, the Kwaito, to contest the idea of a nation state, nation building, specifically with evocation of concepts like the rainbow nation. Uh, they question the, what they think is the uncritical borrowing of what the nation state looks like elsewhere. And, uh, uh, they insist that other role players, artists, musicians, have a role in the whole project of nation building and shouldn't be exclusively a, a reserved to politicians at the political elite. Because if that is the case, then they are likely to shape the nation to suit their interests. So and Jabula mentions a whole host of things such as um, the youth in South Africa. Previously, there was talk that they had become apathetic vis-a-vis -vis electoral processes. But quotes from Feast Must Fall movements to argue that that wasn't the case. It was rather a disillusionment. And uh, uh, having said that point, Jabulo reminded me about a character in, in Chino Achebe's thing, uh, Ant Hills of the Savannah, where a character asks, when will this independent thing come to an end? It was good while we waited. So the youth in South Africa, they may not be as cynical as this character in this fictional work, but clearly they're disillusioned by, by democracy. 
which seems not to be meeting their aspirations and needs. Quick to another equally interesting presentation by Dr. Charles Nwaila on the dichotomy between traditional leadership and democracy, republicanism and monarchy, if you wish. Uh, a fairly interesting presentation. Dr. Nwaila gave us some stats. For instance, he says in South Africa we have got in terms of hierarchy, kings, senior traditional leaders, headmen and women, and gives us to the effect that 7,970 traditional leaders are there in South Africa. We've got 7,127 headmen and head women. We've got 827 senior traditional leaders, and this constitutes traditional councils. And he argues and says that these people are widely spread across the country and they cannot be wished away, much as some of, uh, some of the decisions they make, especially regarding gender and land issues, have evoked a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, conversations and their role in a democracy. But he argues that compared to this number of senior traditional leaders, there are only 250 municipalities in South Africa. So they're widely spread across the country, and they've got an integral part to play in democratization, in as much as some people argue that they constitute a vestige, some anachronistic institution that may not have a role to play in the current dispensation. He used, he used the analogy of a postage stamp and an envelope, and say that a postage stamp adds value to an envelope, and the envelope that does add value to the postage stamp. So South Africa uh, will have to make do with this institution. And what is required to do is to inform it as it were, sounds paternalistic, so as to transform it. How that will be done, that's a conversation for another day. And this reminds me about, because you quoted from the Afrobarometer uh, survey, that across the continent, traditional leadership is actually supported. Malawi, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Mozambique. People who are surveyed, who are polled, they spoke so favorably about traditional leadership. But then there was this one country called Tanzania where the support for traditional leadership is like the lowest at 20%, which reminds me about Mwalimu Julius Nyerere because Mwalimu Nyerere, part of his state nation building project, he recognized that traditional leadership could be inimical to democracy and uh, he demobilized traditional leadership and completely decoupled it from politics because once traditional leadership is embedded in politics and you've got politicians who are wired and mired in patronage and corruption and mobilization along fault lines such as religion tribe, clan, then you've got a tinder box. So I think uh, that kind of uh, observation uh, was extremely pertinent to me. So I think uh, what I would say is that vis-a-vis uh, -vis this, in as much as Dr. Nwaila didn't give any recommendations, I think it's a, it's a kind of arrangement South Africa will have to stay with uh, republicanism, and monarchies, but there are issues that have been raised vis-a-vis -vis the uh, rights of women in some of those jurisdictions, issues to do with the land, and those as kind of aspects and their role in the political arena, those things have to be uh, thrashed out. But uh, the salient point was that this institution is not about to be expunged. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I shout out the Social Economic and Transformation Breakaway Session and I listened to three young men who presented very interesting papers. 
So the first one was by Lelos Kosana. Um, I'm going to dwell more on the recommendations that they made, but if anyone needs to engage them further, I'm here to show who the, um, the, the authors are, and then we can um, engage them further. So Lelos' paper uh, was titled Tracking Economic Policy and Its Outcomes in the First 25 Years of Democracy, Lessons for the Next Phase of South Africa's History. Uh, so this is a paper that looks at various attempts that um, the South African um, government has embarked on to try and deal with economic challenges. It begins by citing the different um, economic policies and the plans, development plans that we have embarked on, including uh, the RRDP, um, GIA, ASKISA, and the new growth path, as well as the NTP at the um, moment. And um, some of the challenges that he identifies are those that are related to the structural issues, which are kind of a legacy of the apartheid um, state. And he also talks about um, the fact that some of these policies lacked clarity. And because of this lack of clarity, they tended to be misinterpreted by those who were implementing them. And he then proposes three recommendations. Uh, the first one being to say, um, as we move forward, we need to be less orthodox and more in innovative in our economic policies and the institutions that implement these um, policies must be very innovative and should not be overly cautious. In other words, they must always be responding to the context in which they are so that at least they respond and, 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 and are clear in what they are doing. Uh, he also recommends that uh, we focus our education outcomes so that they speak to what we require in our communities. His um, recommendation seems to suggest that there is a misalignment between what the economy requires as well as what um, our education institutions are offering. And then the third um, proposal that it brings to the table is to say that um, we need to improve um, the status capacity to be able to coordinate policy so that this silo approach that we seem to have um, is done away with, um, there needs to be uh, improved coordination. The second paper by Tony Shabalala uh, looked at Western medicine, traditional medicine, and how the philosophy of Ubuntu can be used to try and understand the polarization that seems to exist between traditional medicine and Western medicine. And, and his, his argument is that um, traditional medicine seems to have been sidelined and the benefits that it holds also um, have been sidelined and people seem to be concentrating more on Western medication. Uh, we need to accept that there are other ailments and illnesses that Western medicine seems not to understand and by so doing we need to create a relationship between Western medicine and traditional medicine probably even to the extent of saying if someone goes to a hospital and um, they don't seem to be able to assist you, uh, Western medical practitioners should be in a position to refer you to a traditional medicine practitioner so that that rapport between these two um, institutions should be developed and understood so that this tendency of sidelining traditional medication um, should be done away with. Um, so the recommendations that he makes, um, the first one says um, the Department of Health needs to integrate traditional medication into its body. So it needs, in whatever it does, it needs to appreciate that this is part of our life, part of our culture, and it needs to be um, used and, and, and not kind of disparage it as if it's something that is not as of use as it is. And then he also talks about the need to share knowledge between, knowledge and resources between traditional medicine and 
um, Western medicine. There was also a recommendation that as we begin to discuss about the national health insurance, we really need to make sure that traditional medicine is also integrated into this um, NHI so that by so doing, we begin to appreciate the fruits that it can bring. And then the third paper by Khabo Murifi, uh, the title of the paper says, Born Free but Always in Chains, How the Roads Must Fall and Fees Must Fall Movements Define Youth Struggles in Post-Apartheid South Africa. So the idea of this paper is to say, even if uh, these movements played themselves out mainly in institutions of higher learning, they should be understood to be, they should be understood to be broader than that. In other words, they are a framework to try and bring out the struggles that the youth have experienced since the dawn of democracy. And he cites um, a few challenges that um, the, the youth have, have, have faced. And one of them, of course, is the lack of access to education, mainly higher education. And he also cites the issue of spatial geography as a way that affects the youth. And then also the challenges that the youth face in terms of funding for education as well as for um, intrapreneurial activities that they may want to engage in. So the recommendations that he comes up with um, are as follows. Um, he says access to education should not be defined uh, only by the ability to pay. So it is the responsibility of the universities as well as government to ensure that um, young people are able to access education both at whatever level. It can be at primary, secondary, or even at tertiary level. The university and um, the state should be um, in a position to ensure that everyone has access to that. And then he also talks about um, institutional autonomy. You know, universities most of the time would always use um, the idea of institutional um, autonomy as a shield to try and fan away the government from interfering in the activities that universities do. And he says, by so doing, we are actually perpetuating um, exclusion in a way because there are some people that are then not able to access education or even young academics that might want to um, participate in academia are sidelined because of this idea of institutional autonomy that universities will always claim. And his um, recommendation thereof is to say the government must be involved in managing universities so that at least government is aware of what is happening and then probably be in a position to ensure that young people are not sidelined by universities that seem to want to preserve old cultures. He also then recommends that since we are now beginning to discuss about the issue of land, this is also a very emotive issue for the youth and the youth also need to be involved so that in future we do not replicate these fallist movements that we witnessed. So if we ignore um, the involvement of the youth in the land distribution discourse, we are likely to face these issues again in the future. And the last recommendation that he puts on the table has to do with the issue of funding, that we also need to fund uh, postgraduate education. So even if um, the, the tendency seems to be that if someone does a first degree and you are funded for the first degree, then that's adequate. You must then find your way in ensuring that you progress in your education. He says even postgraduate education up to PhD maybe should be funded and the, in, uh, the formal sector or the private sector should also be harnessed to ensure that they participate in doing so and government can actually incentivize uh, the private sector by maybe giving them uh, tax rebates so that they participate in funding um, education. Thank you very much. Uh, no, thanks, uh, colleagues. So that is the, the summary of the sessions. Unfortunately, we will not open them to any Q&A, and I will explain what is the process uh, 
going forward. And as I do so, I wish to invite the VC to the podium uh, because unfortunately, Minister Jackson in Tembo is still in cabinet. It's Wednesday today. There's a cabinet meeting. Um, and as you are aware, the tradition is that the minister, the presidency, addresses the press conference the following day, post-cabinet press conference. And his item in the cabinet, which is current affairs, always happens to be the last. So uh, the spokesperson of cabinet can't then leave cabinet um, as a result. So we'll have the VC to do the closing uh, instead. Just a you know, few things in summary, uh, and also in terms of the way forward. One, I think we'll all agree, colleagues, that we came here yesterday. Uh, the hall was very unhospitable yesterday. It was very cold, but today we came better dressed, warmly dressed, as uh, compared to yesterday. And thanks to the technicians who control temperature here, uh, because you know, today they did much better. But most importantly, I think uh, we came here to interact and to engage with the blessers. Uh, blessers who've been slaying, slaying with knowledge. And I think we'll go home, all of us satisfied that those who were slaying with knowledge and information here have really met our appetite for knowing better than when we came, when we came here. We started yesterday with an uh, enterprising session with the president and the panelists who are here, as well as the engagement from the audience. I think many of you will agree that it was a, a useful session, and it was great that the president stayed to answer questions even from the, from the audience. Now, our responsibility as, as bureaucrats, you know, I was a chief of staff in my previous life. I used to say to them, as the spokespersons who assisted in that regard, that as a politician, you must accept any and every question. You don't have to answer it. You must just accept, you know, don't say, no, I won't answer that. Accept the question, you don't have to answer it. You just come and pass on the message and say, well, as I have said, you know. Um, and so we drill them. But yesterday, I think he answered every question, and people were satisfied with the manner in which he answered. I must say, VC, so the president is in trouble today, he's trending because of a reply to your question. Uh, and that uh, he says there's going to be a jobs bloodbath. So the media took one caption and didn't say, didn't cover what he said before and after. But he was responding to you um, in your, the questions you posed to him about 4IR. That he did say, unless we train our people, unless there's a skills revolution, unless workers are trained, people are going to lose jobs at a massive scale. And that's what is trending in, on ENCA um, today and among opposition uh, benches. Uh, so that's, I suppose, is part of the rigor of the, of the conference. But most importantly, what a, a key highlight of this conference is the diversity of the participants at the conference. I think uh, all of you will uh, agree that you know, we had kind of gray hair professors and we had young people who came with very brilliant ideas. It was part of the original design. So when we engaged as a president with Mistra and UJ and insisted that we need to have young people participate in a conference like uh, this one because it was important for us, they responded you know, uh, to, to, to that call and they challenged each other, especially in the academic space to say, let's go out there and look for young people who will come and make some enterprising presentations here. And I do think some of you who attended sessions where they were younger, you know, people, emerging researchers presenting, you will know that the, the future of knowledge production uh, in South Africa is, uh, is, in, is, in, is in safe hands. Now, we had planners here with academics, we had professors, uh, you know, we had hangers on. They, they came, which is great, because we didn't turn this into a national key point. It was an open space for debate and engagement. We had professors, we had... Um, Students, the media professionals were here. We also had, you know, activists. Uh, as at last count yesterday morning, we had 500 people who had RSVP, and they came at different times. And our original plan was to have 250 people. We didn't think that the number will, um, will, will, will double. And we continue to receive feedback even from people who are not here. Now, unfortunately, 
it is not all the papers that were presented here in their original form are going to be made available immediately. They will be made available in uh, different forms because the authors who presented here are still shaping some of their work and there are reviews that are being made. But as for PowerPoint presentations, we will make those uh, you know, available once the authors submit them. But as for the papers themselves, I will explain how the process is going to unfold. As I had said, uh, and other, many other speakers had made an argument, 25 years is a very crucial milestone in the history of any nation. Uh, if you have a child who's 25 years old, like I do, I'm sure you'll understand what it means to have witnessed something evolve over 25 years. Uh, amongst us here, there are people who've got 25 years to go before retirement. Amongst us here, uh, there are people who are only 25 years old, and there are people uh, who actually have, you know, 25 years, depending on how healthy you are and so on. Uh, and there are people who will take another 25 years before they become professors. So it can be very long, and in politics it can also, uh, can it be long, but can also be short. Now we have experimented as South Africa over the past 25 years, and I think the papers presented here are a testament to that. And so at this critical point of reflection, there are questions that have been asked. We've attempted to answer those. And for ourselves as government, we took a decision that we're not going to write a macro social report on the basis of just desktop information available to us. It is important that we go and test ideas. It was important that we don't rely only on the official 25-year review uh, a report, which will be launched soon, or any other surveys that have been presented. So we needed to also gain some fresh insights and critical reflections from the people who have made presentations here. So what we will do going forward is that we will produce a macro social report, which is a synthetic narrative about a um, you know, 50 page document. The last one was done in the presidency called The Nation in the Making, which was in 2000 and 2006. And the most of the you know, data that was used there was um, derived from the 20, 10 years of, of democracy, uh, you know, the, the, re the review done then, as well as other surveys. So we'll produce a macro social report by the end of this year, by November, in fact. That's the contract we have between UJ and the MISTRA. And this is a report that will be different from the last one, which is this one. It will be different in a sense that we are asking a question. We know what has happened in the past 25 years, but we are as much interested in what we think needs to happen over the next 25 years in terms of step change. How do we do things differently? In order to achieve the strategic goal of the struggle, which was to create a non-sexist, non-racial, democratic, united, and prosperous South Africa. And that's a kind of a synthetic narrative that we will be producing. It's a report that is above the 25-year review report that the Department of Planning, Monitoring, and Evaluation uh, is, is working on. And we will make sure that all of you who has attended the conference is invited to the session where we table the macro social report, which is a discussion document. Why is November crucial? It's because we want something that will impact on the decisions. So this will go to the Mahotla of cabinet as well as that of the ruling party because they need to know uh, what the key, uh, key issues are. And the report will be over and above just mere statistics because sometimes numbers, they can create some challenges because you can be complacent if you look at the numbers. So we do know that we have exceeded the SDG target for access of young girls to education because we have close to universal access to primary education for young people. As they go to high school, they begin to drop out. We now know that the number of young, of black women participating in the labor market in 2019 is more than double that of those who participated in the formal labor market in 1994. And there's many other numbers which the SG aptly spoke about yesterday. However, that doesn't make us a non-sexist society. 
And so the critical question that the Maxwell Report will look at is, what then needs to be done differently in order for us to pursue this goal of becoming a non-sexist society? And I'm using just that as an example. That's as an, as, an, as an example of the kind of uh, a reflection you must expect from the macro um, social report. And so that is how it, is, it will distinguish itself from the past. It's a product that must impact on police. But because we're in an academic environment and we have uh, uh, professors and researchers here who need a portfolio of evidence, they must go back and show that they were in a conference and so on. We will also produce the conference abstracts uh, in a book, and it's vital. And those who are in the academy know what that means. Uh, you know, there are people here, deans of research and so on, uh, who are waiting uh, uh, to see the portfolios of evidence. And so we will produce that for everybody who presented their paper uh, here so they appear in the conference um, uh, abstract. And over and above that, we are, we are encouraging all of you to continue with this debate, write opinion pieces, you know, engage publicly with some of the papers that were presented there, or just the idea of marking 25 years of democracy. But in addition to that, because again, we're in an academic space, and please, as you leave this room here, there are two stands here where they are selling books, uh, Mistra books, and many other books by colleagues who are here and uh, UJ academics, please make sure you grab a copy. I think they are discounted uh, just after lunch today. So make sure you get a copy on your, on your way out. And so we are going to produce an edited volume as well, a book out of the conference papers. And so for the authors uh, who've made presentations here, we will be writing formally to them, just explaining the process going forward, which includes giving them a style guide, for the publication that we're gonna be, the publisher that we'll be using, and it's the kind of additional questions that we will be sending to them. Hopefully by end of August, all of you will return those papers using the style, the style guide, and we'll start the process of producing a book. Our timeline is that this book needs to be out uh, in the first quarter of 2019. Uh, all things uh, being equal, Professor Chris Landsberg is here, oh, 2020. Professor Chris Lansbeck is here. I believe he's carrying a whip. So when you get those uh, emails that are reminding you of deadlines, even if they are signed by Tuzani uh, or any other person, you must know they were drafted by Professor Chris Lansbeck. And so that is how the process would, would unfold going forward. We are hoping that in two and a half years, we will do another conference which is called the midterm. So then it will be a pit stop on the basis of the program of the current administration. So some of the things that the DG, the PME was talking about yesterday, that we must congregate again and say, how far are we? If the target is to create a million jobs over five years at halfway, if you've only created 100,000, we know it's impossible to create 100,000 in two and a half years. And that's a kind of a critical reflection that you will have. As the president said, finally, we we back in business in terms of engaging with the thinking enterprise, uh, and we expect to engage, you know, research institutions, think tanks, and other people who've got ideas to shape public policy as it goes forward. Our policy agenda will be defined in the MTSF, which will be out in the first um, week of uh, September. Part of the step change this time around is that ministers will sign these performance agreements which must have detail. Because we just need to know, it is not enough to say we'll, we'll bring a million tourists to South Africa. We are as interested in knowing from where will the million tourists come from. Now if you want to target a million tourists from Russia and there is nobody in South Africa, I think even uh, 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 Professor Filatova who taught us history, can't speak Russian anymore. So if you speak a million Russian tourists here and there is nobody who speaks Russian, then we're not creating an ecosystem for a million tourists from Russia. So those are the type of questions that ministers will be at, you know, unpacking in their performance agreements so that we move into the realm of the concrete uh, and not just the, uh, you know, big dreams. And it's important for the president to manage the process like that going forward. Finally, we thank the principal sponsors of this conference. Um, Professor Mawala for hosting here, 
if we owe the university any money, you can use the VCs fund to absorb those costs. Um, you know, <laughs> Prof. Camilla, you know, Prof. Landsberg, and there's Dawn somewhere, and many others because you've been the host. We thank um, Mistra, uh, Peter Maibuye in, uh, in his absence. I make sure to cut my hair because people have been saying, oh, Joel and the policy unit, I make sure so that there's a clear distinction. Um, you know, that uh, uh, there's a difference between me and him. Uh, and so that's why I cut my hair just for control. Uh, and, and Mistra. And then there are those who are uh, our, you know, financial blessers. So they are blessers who blessed us with knowledge and information. We also had blessers uh, who blessed us with some of the resources to do this. So when I first thought of the idea of this conference, I met a former colleague, Peggy Kumalo, who works for Anglo. And I said to him, I'm sure in the chairman's fund there's change. You know, before the end of the financial year, corporate never really finishes this budget, although they will turn down our applications. Uh, you know, so fortunately, they had some resources, so they came into the party. Uh, Tabang is here from NetBank. He was here. We also went uh, to, to, to him. And uh, so he enjoyed home ground advantage in terms of printing programs. That's why they are using NetBank. You know, because they, ran, they use a net bank printer. And it's automatic if you print from there that is put their stamp there. So I just want to make sure so that you don't think we are captured by them. <laughs> it's because that's the kind of a home ground advantage. We've got Doreen here from AP InBev. She didn't sponsor. They're now envious because they don't see their logo here. It's fine. We are coming to you next year. There's many other research programs in this university and elsewhere where you can still provide their support. Multi choice, they, they actually recording. So the entire conference is on record uh, and, and we'll make some of these uh, things you know, uh, available. You will see some of the highlights of this conference in community TV. If you don't know, there is community TV, including How TV, KZN TV, uh, you know, and all these other you know, church type TVs. They are actually community te uh, TVs. You'll also see some of this uh, information there. And Coke, make sure on your way out, you know, you pick a few cans of Coke, you know. They, they create, in fact, the hospitality that we enjoy there with the courtesy of uh, Coke. There is uh, someone who made it into the logo. Uh, we still have that IOU note we'll send to them uh, so that they also must, must pitch. We still have a book at the report to produce and we'll go to them. Uh, if there is uh, resources available, we'll certainly do that. And I must thank the colleagues. Some of them are there on top, in the Kwezi, uh, Olelua, uh, Linda, and many others who are here who actually put this conference together. Uh, mine was to tell them what we needed, and they orchestrated this entire thing, and uh, we must thank them for taking good care of us and for ensuring that this was a useful, um, you know, uh, engagement. I must also thank uh, Mem Peggy for being here for, for, for two days. Uh, you know, thank you for, you know, t honoring us uh, by uh, being here. I think many people who are here, you know, are sure that this was really an important, um, you know, conference because you... You stayed for those days and we mustn't take that for granted. And also thank all the guys who are running the cameras and other, the Jimmy Chip, there's something called the Jimmy Chip, they were running there on top. Uh, so, Prof Mawal, I give it to you. Thank you, colleagues. San Wonan, I'm glad you're still awake. Wusani? Um, uh, when we talked about uh, this uh, two days, it all seemed to be a dream, but you have made it a reality. Let's give him a round of applause. I also would like to acknowledge uh, all of you for coming here. I see Mrs. Uh, Zanelembeki, you're still here. Uh, we always uh, look for an excuse to get you to the University of Johannesburg, you know, and we are going to continue to do so. And also the leadership of the University of Johannesburg, uh, Camilla, and uh, your faculty, uh, you have done a fantastic job. Uh, let's give uh, the faculty... Um, 
So, Wusani, you talk about bless us. As a vice chancellor of a university, when I hear the word bless us, I get very nervous. <laughs> I almost think about running for security so that I can keep them away from my campus, you know. <laughs> but certainly, um, we had um, quite a, a number of, of people who, who have made this uh, possible. Mistra uh, was uh, an organization that uh, we partnered with. The presidency, I think let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Anglo-American, um, you know, let's give them a round of applause. NetBank, you know, I am on the board of, uh, of NetBank, so you can even give them a very resounding uh, uh, round of applause. DSTV, DSTV, Business Leadership, South Africa, Coca-Cola. These are the organizations that made this possible. You know, uh, there's always a complaint that in South Africa we are never run short of talking. That in South Africa, our ability to produce words far outpaces our ability to put those words into action. So I think this is actually some, something that we shouldn't uh, take for granted. The president was here yesterday, and of course, we're living in a period where the world is changing very, very quickly. The next 25 years is going to see much more dynamic changes than we have ever seen. By the end of it, by the end of it, we will be able to change people's intelligence through gene editing. It's gonna happen in the next 25 years. By the end of it, our factories will be much, much, much smaller and will be producing more. This is not uh, some scary thought. It's not something that is coming from, uh, from the Terminator. You still remember the movie, The Terminator? I watched it in 1987 when I was in high school. And, uh, and it was talking about artificial intelligence. Of course, we never took you probably never took, uh, uh, took notice of that because you were waiting for that uh, Terminator to, to do some action and to be back. Now, we have deliberated quite a great deal. Now it is time to go to work. Unemployment is a big issue. 30% unemployment rate. And, the, and the, the problem with our unemployment rate is that it's very resilient. It's very, very resilient. The economists will call it a sticky uh, unemployment rate. It, it doesn't seem to change. It hovers around between 25 and 30 percent. And many people even suspect that it is higher. What we see is what we measure that there are people who have been discouraged and they are not counted. These are big issues. And I think we are not going to solve these problems without sacrifices. We'll have to make some fundamental sacrifices. For us to deal with the issue of unemployment, some serious sacrifices will have to be done. And Wusani, I think uh, your, one of your role should be to see how do, we, how do we prepare our people for such sacrifices. We're living in an era where the world is becoming much more, uh, much more prosperous globally. Uh, access to knowledge is at an unprecedented rate. I mean, I, I seem to remember at one stage, I read on, I was in high school, I read on a magazine called Archimedes, which used to be published by what now is called the National Research Foundation. 
and they were talking about superconductivity. I went around everywhere to look for information on superconductivity. I couldn't find it. You will agree with me that today that information is available at our fingertips. And because information is available, it means those with determination, those with, with drive, are able to participate in the economy much better than before. As a university, we believe that the next 25 years, which is definitely very, very important, the last 25 years is important for us to be able to understand our strengths and so on and, for, and so forth. But going forward in the next 25 years, knowledge is going to become very, very important. Wisdom is going to become very, very important. In the theory of, of wisdom, they say you have data. And from data, you can extract information. From information, you can extract knowledge. And from knowledge, you can extract wisdom. Because data is no longer... Is no long, having access to data is no longer as priced as before. Get, having access to information is not as difficult as it has been before. Our ability, our ability to get wisdom out of, of data and information and knowledge is going to be the skill that we need in order for us to succeed. And I think as universities we should continue to play that role. Here we did discuss the last 25 years. Uh, we discussed the issues of economic justice and poverty. Of course, our ability to deal with issues of economic justice and poverty depends on how well we can be able to mobilize resources uh, within our country. We talked about uh, the issue of a developmental state. The fourth industrial revolution. You see, I don't like bombastic words. Albert Einstein used to, was once quoted saying that uh, things must not only be made simple, but they must be made simpler. So amidst all these um, bombastic words, developmental state, fourth industrial revolution, what do we really mean? What we really mean is how do we create a system that will allow our people to be able to generate wealth so that they can be better off? That is really what it is all about. So that if they are sick, they can be able to have access to hospitals that are good. So that if they want education, they can go to institutions with resources. Institutions with uh, computers, access to internet, so that they can learn. So that they can be able to get food. And not have young people growing uh, stunted for no other reason except that they do not have access to proper uh, nutrition. That is really what it's all about. It is about changing the material conditions of our people. So ultimately, the measure of how successful these two days are, have been, is going to be by how much they are going to contribute towards the improving of the lives of our people. And of course, we can't be able to do it alone. It has to be a revolution. Civil society is absolutely crucial. Government is actually quite crucial. Industry is quite crucial. And sometimes I have a feeling that in our society, we are a society that is in constant conflict. It's sector, you know, government against, uh, and society against the private sector. The private sector thinks government is not doing what it's supposed to do. 
And you know, in the theory of complexity, I'm a scientist, and in, in complexity, they tell you that uh, if you have objects within a system that are in conflict with one another, then it cannot be directed. You cannot be able to, to move to a specific direction. And I think um, as we move forward, we need to be thinking about how we're going to mobilize all the forces in our society so that we can pull towards the same direction. We don't have to all agree. We don't have even have to all agree uh, on, on, on approach. But we have to create a system with all our disagreements that we, we move, collectively move towards a direction where people's lives are going to be improved socially, economically, politically. And of course, for us to be able to do that, all these sectors must be strong. The state must be strong. Our society must be strong. One of the things that really worries me is how fragile our society has become. And of course, when you are facing huge challenges as our society has, has faced, um, very difficult to make yourself strong. Our industries are, are not as strong as they're supposed to be. You don't know what is going to happen to the mining industry. Some people even call it the sunset industry. But we know that if it is indeed a sunset uh, industry, then we are in trouble going forward. If you look at uh, the manufacturing sector, we have been deindustrializing uh, for the past 30, 30 years, 35 years. And what has happened now is that we have become a society of consumers. This morning as I was coming here, I was doing, um, analyzing the things that I'm I was consuming. My shoes were made in Vietnam. My clothes were made, okay, the suit was made in Johannesburg, by the way. You know. And by the way, I will refer you to the tailor who made this suit, you know. But the cloth was imported. At least there is local uh, 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 value add. And the car that I was driving, it's a Japanese car. So you cannot be prosperous if you are consuming more than you are producing. If your consumption is higher than your production, you are in the long run in trouble. And those are the things that we need to find out. How do we get out of this? How do we get out of this uh, issue that everything we consume is almost uh, uh, imported. Of course, you are not going to produce, you know, you're not going to produce cell phones unless you are educated. And let us be very clear about that. If you don't have enough electronics engineers, if you don't have enough uh, uh, applied physicists, you are not going to have, uh, 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 you know, uh, a telephone, a cell phone manufacturing industry. You can't have a viable electronic industry unless you are educated. And that is why we are here. That is why we are here and we, what we want to do, what we are doing is to give people excellent education that is on par with what is happening in Tokyo or in Berlin or in New York. And for us to be able to do that, we all have to pull together. Industries must be at our universities. Our universities must be in industry. Our universities must be in government. Government must be in our, uh, in, in our universities. We have to work together, you know, so that um, what our strength become the strength of all these other forces in our society. So thank you very much uh, for coming to the University of Johannesburg. And by the way, for those of you who do not know, this is the largest university in Johannesburg. 
with 52,000 people, with 52,000 um, students, it is definitely one of the largest universities in South Africa. Not only that, almost close to 80% of our graduates, more than 80% of our graduates, are graduates from families who have never gone to university before. In the family tree, there was never anybody who has gone to the university before. So you can see why it is very important that we give them excellent education. Because not only are we transforming individuals, but we are transforming communities, and ultimately we are transforming society. So just in conclusion, I would like to single out some of the other people who played quite a, a crucial role here. Dr. Nolita Vukuza, please stand up so that you can be seen and be cheered. She is even having red gloves. Dr. Linda Mtwisha, please stand up so that you can also be acknowledged and seen and be celebrated. <laughs> Professor Camila Naidu, please stand up so that you can be acknowledged. I can see, you probably are noticing that uh, this was all done by women, isn't it? Tina? Dr. Don Naga, please stand up so that you can also be acknowledged. Dr. Weston Smilamo, you are the only man. <laughs> But certainly, thank you very much. So, and also, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Landsberg. You see, every time I have to tell you about uh, Professor Landsberg, every time uh, his last name is mentioned, he keeps on telling me that, you know, when Adolf Hitler was was imprisoned in Landsberg prison. And he keeps on reminding me that he had nothing to do with it, you know. <laughs> that uh, it is just completely coincidental, you know. So thank you very much, uh, Sia Wonga, and we hope to see you again at the University of Johannesburg. And Busani, please stand up so that you can also be acknowledged because you were the driver of this uh, 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 project. Thank you very much. No, thank you uh, very much, colleagues. Uh, Coke is served. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I said Coke. Coke is served, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can all the colleagues who are in the steering committee... Hello, Colin. Can the, all those who are in the steering committee, if they can come here for a group photo... Quasi. Quasi. Yeah.